Space Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Not Alone Podcast. I'm Sam Fredrickson. And I'm Jason Moisoso. And today we're going to take you through some tales of time slips. Uh, really quick, we'd like to thank Christops from the uh, Eastern Border Podcast. He actually suggested the idea, just said that he'd like to hear something about time travel and all of that. So we did some digging, figured it'd be a great show. And uh, that's, uh, that's what this week's going to be about. I'm excited. Because really, I spent, a, I learned a lot about time travel. Did you? Yes, I did. Now I learned all the science to say it's wrong. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's talk about time slips, time travel. So ever since 1895, which was the publication of H.G. Wells' uh, short story, The Time Machine, time travel has been ubiqui- ubiquitous in our science fiction, in our culture, um, and in that short story, it was actually the first time that the time machine, that term, concept, yeah. yeah, the concept was used and coined where um, it, we visualized space as another dimension that we could use, uh, move through if only we had the proper vehicle. And uh, in that book, the narrator uh, goes through and he jumps like to the year into eight. Into the future. Yeah. yeah. He jumps into like 802,701 ad uh and he finds that humanity's evolved into two different groups he has some misadventures there and then he jumps forward 30 million years in time and then he just keeps jumping forward and forward and forward and then he sees the earth stop rotating and he sees the sun go Death, out and yeah what i love about it is i was reading a synopsis of the book and it says the narrator witnesses the sun go dark and the earth cease to rotate this overwhelms the narrator I'm like, I, <laughs> yeah. I bet it does. I bet it does. You don't does. say. But that is, that's, that's the first. You know what I like about it? Mm. He doesn't go back in time. No, he doesn't. Well, he goes back in time to his own time. but Yeah, but he doesn't go anywhere farther. Yeah, and that's fine. Which actually works for most of the science. Most of the science. So, well, and that's, I it's guess like that that's, what, uh, that's what Jason wants to contribute to this, this episode. He's really excited about time travel. So, Jason, why don't you talk to us a little bit about time travel in general and about why it can or alternatively cannot work? Okay. So, uh, it pretty much starts off with Einstein and the idea that both space and time are fairly much one the same mm-hmm. so that you can bend it. Uh, one obvious showing in some uh, experiments that we've already had is with time dilation. Now, this is essentially just being in space and moving quickly. Our clocks are relatively slower than what actually happens on Earth. The faster mm-hmm. you go nearing light speed, uh, the more time dilation occurs. Uh, this actually happens with our satellites, and we actually have to uh, forward their clocks every once in a while so it actually maintains the correct time. Theorized is just being able to essentially go into space, zoom around near light speed, come back to Earth, and even though you might have experienced you know, a couple of years, Earth would have experienced 500. Mm. So that's one of the easiest ways that we could potentially have time travel towards the future is through time dilations. And that's, I mean, this has been something kind of covered in pop culture for quite a while. Uh, Most recently, I think what's been probably the best is um, probably Interstellar. Yes, it is. Because time dilation occurred also from from mass gravity as Mm -hmm. well uh, from the black hole that one of the planets they visited. They spent a couple hours there. Well... The guy up in their spaceship spent seven years for every one of their hours. Yeah. So it's heartbreaking. So, yeah. It's, if you haven't seen Interstellar, it's amazing. It's literally my it's favorite amazing. movie. It's amazing. It's amazing. There we go. There it is. It's, uh, it's literally my favorite movie. So just turn this off, throw your phone in the garbage, we'll wait. and go watch, uh, go watch Interstellar. Well, you don't have to throw your phone in the garbage. Just... It's on Hulu. Just watch is it, it on Yes, it awesome. is on Hulu. All right, Download so Hulu. We're... Use your friend's login. No. <laughs> That's a little more of a morally gray area. Um, all right. We're going to wait for two hours. It's actually like two and a half hours. So It's okay. Um, we'll just shoot off into space real quick. Time and dilation. we're back. All right. <laughs> so... Time dilation, that's a great... So yeah, that's one of the easy ways mm-hmm. of going forward in time. Now, of course, the faster you move towards light speed, mm-hmm. the infinitely more massive you become. 
Okay. And the infinitely more energy it takes to move you because of that. So that's why you can't it's go a, past the speed of light, right? That infinite and a few other things. Yeah, you need infinite, infinite energy in order to possibly pass it. Um, and that's that's one of the biggest issues with us time traveling in like a blink of an eye. One other way that you could do it, of course, is through wormholes. And mm -hmm. that's, that's the fun one. Um, the catch with wormholes, though, is that you can't really go back in time unless the wormhole, one of the wormholes, was formed at that period of time. So say, like, I make a time machine. Mm -hmm. Really what that time machine does is create two wormholes, both right now in 2017. Now, with time dilation, I can take that second wormhole, speed it up into space, come back a thousand years later, and it's actually still there. So I have the original, and then I have the new one. Now, the catch is that I can't go anywhere farther back in time than where the wormhole the was originally generated. Was. Yeah, okay. So it could be 3017, but the farthest I can go back is 2017. Mm. Okay. So that's the biggest catch with, with wormholes. Now, of course, there's other issues with, say, paradoxes, which lead you to assume that one of three things can be occurring um, if you go back in time. One, not, not able to do so. It's not naturally possible. Okay. Two, um, no matter what occurs, you cannot actually alter events. Right. Or three. That's how I believe. And we'll talk about more of like our theories. Multiverse. On. Right, multiverse. Which well. multiverse also supports string theory, which mm -hmm. is always kind of fun. We're not going to get into that. No, we're not. No, we're not. No, we have an hour. We need to. <laughs> we don't have seven years. Anyway, the uh, the so. catch the catch with that is that um I like to think of it like a ray of light, and then the, a prism is kind of like our time machine. So we are on this ray of light in the presence at the very very tip of it. Now, if That's I want to so go back poetic. 30 years, let's say my time machine again is that prism, mm -hmm. and we travel back a measurable distance on that light ray. As soon as I step off, that prism generates a whole bunch of different colors, right? It right. separates the color. So that is all the different possible universes that I just stepped onto because there are an infinite number of colors and shades and hues that could be all infinitely different universes. Right. So that's the way I like to picture it in my mind. And that's the catch, is that if we do go back in time, the likelihood of us actually going back and hitting our own universe that we originated from is pretty much zero. Okay. Because of all the different... all the different Because uh, all the little teeny tiny changes, just us being there would put us on a different universe. Now, the idea of multiverse is simple and eloquent and awesome, but a lot of times science isn't that simple. Right. So... That's, I mean, that's some of the, the trickiness with the science of it is, yes, because of uh, Einstein's theory of space-time, it's possible, theoretically, to go back in time, but what would occur if we did? Or is it actually? And our theories just are currently incorrect from the information that we know now. Anyway, cool. the easy answer is time traveling forward, easy. Backward, not, uh, not so much. If, rough. If, po if possible at all. Which, right. according to that, that article, which we'll link to the show notes, it's by uh, the great Michio Kaku. Uh, you can do your uh, own research as well. There we go. That article um, does talk more about how it is theoretically possible and how just in the last few years, noted scientists like you know Stephen Hawking originally said, there's just no way for us to go back fo backwards in time. And now he's saying, well, there's a way. It's just not super efficient so right and it's not like we've ever observed wormholes we haven't right. and it's theorized that it'd be incredibly hard to keep it stable yeah as well so there's some trickiness to it yep i can dig it thank you for that jason that's you're really, welcome um, sam really informative and i think that hopefully that should give people a bigger grasp on time traveling and i'm general. not saying i'm like an expert at all <laughs> that's right. kind of the bare bones breaking it down yeah yeah we are not scientists at all um if you want to know more about science in general uh, i would recommend checking out the mad scientist podcast uh he's a scientist we are not scientists as you did there so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's what we call a plug um so now what makes time slips which of course is the the subject of today's episode different from time travel is that they don't require any sort of apparatus any machine any planning even any, it just happens it just happens you're just one minute you're here one minute you're gone now, it seems to be random. Some people experiencing bright lights in the sky or different physical or visual cues. Other people, one it's minute they're here, just... one minute they're there. Yeah. 
So that is what we are going to jump into. This week's episode's a little different uh, because we're not super focused on on hard evidence this week. We're not. Well, I mean, we still are. I mean, Every... it's 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 really really <laughs> tough to focus on hard evidence with with time slips because there, it it's is. not like something's brought back. It's not right. You know, it's it's and a there's... couple of people's accounts. Essentially, yeah, like, I mean, there is compelling evidence. All we got. For, there's compelling evidence for all these stories, but it's not like you know the Jersey Devil where there's hoof prints in the snow. It's not like King Tut where people are dying and having heart attacks and stuff like that. Um, it's all just great stories, and uh, that's that's really what we wanted to do. They're more like week. misadventures, really. I mean, yeah. it's like now because we're dealing with um, we're dealing with people long dead in places that have changed. Sometimes time slips get kind of lumped in with hauntings or spirits. Why do you think that is? Just purely the, the age of time? Yeah, well, I think it's just that if you're seeing people in, you know, Victorian dress... Do you instantly think, oh, it's, it's present a day, it's a yeah. ghost. So, and that is actually kind of, well, not Victorian, but that's where our first story takes us. So, one of the most well-known incidents of a time slip is what's referred to as the Moberly Jordan incidents incident, or it's also known as like the Ghosts of Versailles or the Phantom of Versailles. The key players in this are Charlotte Anne Moberly and Eleanor, I think it's Jordan. Both of the women were accomplished scholars. They came from respected families. Moberly was actually the first principal of the St. Hugh's College, which was the uh, all-women college that is a part of Oxford University. That's a pretty awesome title. Yep, it is. It's uh, something to hang your hat on. Uh, Jordan was the first person to sit for a, a verbal defense of her thesis at Oxford, the first woman to do so in modern times. So both of them... That was uh, right before the turn of the 20th century, Yeah, correct? that was yeah. 1886. So both of them are very well-educated uh, women who... Uh, good heads know, on their shoulders. Good heads on their shoulders, mm -hmm. exactly. Now, on the 10th of August, 1901, they were visiting the Palace of Versailles in Paris, which, as you may or may not know, uh, the Palace of Versailles is a royal reg residence. It's where, like, King Louis, I think it's the, the 15th or the 16th, he lived there. That's where they had all their lavish parties. That's where Marie Antoinette lived and all of that. Um, it's a location that has become synonymous with the French monarchy, but also, like, the decadence, the causes of the French Revolution as people are dying and starving in the streets. and they, Right, you uh, see the polar ends of wealth. Yes, yes. So they decided, okay, well, we're going to go for a little exploring, a little adventure, and uh, they decide to Because wander. the grounds are completely covered in garden. Yes, it's beautiful. Just gorgeous stuff. Isn't um, it like 17 acres? It's huge. Yeah, it's yeah. very, very large. But they had a guidebook. They had a map. They were like, okay, we know where we're going. Uh, and so they decide to... to wander about they're going towards a specific it was like a royal apartment that um that marie antoinette used that's what they were looking for and suddenly out of nowhere things just seem to to change so they both describe a depression just gripping them it produced an emotional change in them so they felt helpless they felt in despair something just changed out of nowhere and they also noticed that the trees and the uh, like, the buildings and stuff looked weird. They weren't casting shadows. It was nearly dead silent, and they said that the quality of like the trees and the buildings seemed more akin to like the decorations of a stage play than real life. So then, what proceeded to unfold? Well, as soon as they noticed that um, you know things were looking different, seeming not as real, they. Uh, they started to see other anomalies, basically. They saw people dressed very regally and, and very much like a, a product of the past. Even then, in 18, or 1901, it was still a product of that past as well. Uh, as they wandered around, they saw people in exceptionally fine dress. They saw a, a beautiful older woman just meandering through the gardens. They also saw a man whose face was just horribly disfigured uh, with Yeesh. smallpox, um, which 
yeah, not really something that happens anymore, but it is gross. I wouldn't look up pictures of it if I were you. Thank you, you vaccines. Uh, But that's all up to you. Now, some of the people they saw seemed to be stuck in just a tableau. They were just frozen in time uh, and and just stayed in whatever position they were. And other ones actually moved about and they tried to actually talk to the women, but they were speaking in French. Neither of them really knew French and they just kind of kept walking. Eventually, they did make it to their destination, crossing a bridge wading through more of this. Now, as soon as they made it there, everything went back to normal. The lights, quote unquote, Hmm. came back on, the spirits or long gone people, the images disappeared. And um, Peculiar. Yes, very strange. Now, they both researched Versailles and the gardens, and uh, they came to the conclusion that they had stepped back into the year 1789, right before the French Revolution had led to the imprisonment and execution of many of the nobles of France, inc- France, including Marie Antoinette, who they believed to be that that beautiful older woman uh, in the, the elegant dress. They published a book, I believe it came out in 1911, it was called An Adventure, and they did it under pseudonyms at first, and the book was quite a hit, but just ripped apart by... Yeah, it got quite a bit of criticism. Yeah, just, just destroyed. And I mean, their tale in general did, right? Yeah. Well, there were so many different explanations. There was one guy who even came out and said, well, what they saw was um, me and some buddies. We like to we like to dress up like old timey folk. (laughs) And uh, that's what they saw. They just saw me and my buddies. Yeah. And um, I mean, things like that. There are also people saying, well, it was a, a hallucination. It was a shared hallucination. And then, of course, people also said, well, they're just lying. But what I mean, the, that's a possibility. It totally is. Like, it's always a possibility that people are lying, that people. Yeah, are, are we I, I think I think we always want to make life more interesting than what mm-hmm. it is. Yeah. Well, and here on the show, we give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And that's uh, that's how we're going to approach this story and the rest of them as well. But there is some pretty compelling evidence for this story. Like what? Well, what? Their, what, what occurred is, like I mentioned, they went over a bridge to get yeah, to their final destination. Right. Now, when the book came out, one of the biggest criticisms is there's no bridge. There's Ooh, no okay. bridge where they, they say there's a bridge, and they're pointing to maps. A little bit of a plot twist there. People are going there and taking, I don't know if they're taking pictures of there not being a bridge, but... Is there any remnants of a bridge? Well, there's no remnants of a bridge, but what is uncovered is a map. So they're working off the obviously the modern maps, the right, modern of course, interpretation. The, the current, I guess, current as in 1901. Yes. What happens is they actually do uncover a map from that exact time period, and there is there's a bridge right there, right where they said it was. So that's probably the most compelling evidence. And and granted, maybe they just found the map before anybody else and wrote that part in. But the bridge is such a little detail. That it's like, why? Why why lie about it? You'd have to have such foresight in this, this 15, 20 year long hoax, which by the way, went a long way. They finally said, no, it, it's us. We're going to rip away the pseudonyms. It, ran, it went a long way to damaging their reputation. Right. I mean, you've got two very high professional careers. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's one of those things like, why would you lie? And if you're going <laughs> to lie... Go big or go home. Yeah, like, don't I mean, that's hinge fair. your lie on a on a bridge. But who knows? So that's probably the most well known famous time slip account. But as far as I could tell, that's the only time there's ever been a time slip at Versailles. And that's very indicative of time slips in general. They it's not as though there is, you know, like you were saying, a, a stationary wormhole or anything that you just walk through. Right. And everybody who passes through that same route does the same thing. Usually it affects one person in one place and it never happens again to the person or the place. But there is one place that's a little bit breaks the mold on it. Yeah. Is a it a uh, little bold about it? It it is a bit bold indeed. <laughs> so Is it uh, is it a bold street, Sam? Bold street, Liverpool <laughs> for five dollars. <laughs> okay. All right, okay. It is, it is, yeah. So in Liverpool, there's a street called Bold Street. Thank you, Jason. Yep. Um, I do what I can. It has one of the highest reports of time slips anywhere. Uh, now, it's a fairly well-trafficked street. It's lined with businesses and it's been pedestrianized, so there's not a lot of cars or anything like that. People just walk up and down the street. 
Like I said, it's got a lot of yeah. stories. Now, turn a corner into a dead end alley, and hey, you're back 100 years. Exactly. And there no, we go. No, it was like 40 years, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So the first one that we have is from 2006. Yes. Uh, and a thief named Sean is actually booking it down um, Bold Street, Bold Liverpool. Street. Yep. Uh, a, a guard following him on pursuit. He takes a turn into a dead end alley, but as soon as he makes that turn, everything seems to change. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually looks around. He, he doesn't have any cell phone signal. Everything looks odd. People are wearing weird clothing. And he finds a newspaper. And it's stating that it's eight, uh, 1967. 1967. Yeah, the 1967. Date is, the date is the 18th of May, 1967. And... um. Yeah, you can imagine how that freaked him out. All the cars, all the people dressing weird. Uh, and then, as a seemingly simple as he got to 1967, he returns back to present date. 2006 at that point. 2006. Yeah. And it just, like, starstruck him almost. He's mm -hmm. dumbfounded with what, what he experienced. Now, what also was interesting about this account is that the guard followed him around the corner, and he just seemed to have vanished. Yeah, he... he confirmed it basically the thief sean ran ducked into this alley he's like okay everything's gonna be fine he's not gonna find me here and then sure enough the guard didn't find him all of that happens and he tells his story to a local newspaper called the echo well the echo interviews him four separate times he tells the exact same story every time mm -hmm. which if you're lying is very hard to do he also, they also then interview the security guard who says, yeah, man, I was booking it. I was chasing him. I was, I almost had him. He ducked into this alley. I ducked into the alley behind him and he was Oof. gone just out of there. Bizarre. Um, like I said, it's, we don't have a lot of hard evidence here, but we do have these little correlating accounts. That to me is my favorite bold street story, but there are a few others. You know, another fascinating one is that of Frank and Carol, who were a husband and wife who were shopping in Liverpool mm -hmm. one day back in 1966, or 1996, sorry. They were headed towards Bold Street so that Carol could visit Waterstones, which was a large bookstore. But as they approached it, Frank, he saw a friend and he bumped into the friend and they started chatting and Carol said, okay, whatever, I'm going to go on without you. And uh, Frank is just there chatting with a friend. After a few minutes, he says, okay, well, I got to get back to Carol. He starts moving down the street and suddenly a car comes out of nowhere. And remember, Bold Street is pretty much pedestrianized, so there's not a lot of cars anyway. But this van comes and almost swides, side swipes him. He uh, says, OK, that's weird. But he keeps on going. He doesn't really think too much of it other than the car looked a little old timey. As he gets to <laughs> where he knows, he knows where Waterstones is. He gets towards it. And he looks up at the sign, and he sees that the sign says Crips. He says, that's interesting. As he's staring up at the sign, he sees another woman who is also in modern dress. You know, everybody else is in, in right. 1960s dress. But this, this woman is dressed in modern time uh, apparel. They're, they're looking up at the sign, and then they both realize as well that this is a bookstore, but there is. There's clothing in the windows. There's ladies' boots and umbrellas and hats and all of that. And the one woman says, that's strange. I thought they sell, sold books here. And he said, I did too. And they go in together. And as soon as they go in, they're back in, in present day. They're in Waterstones. There's books everywhere. He sees Carol and meets up with her. And it Man, just... that's a good exit point for a wormhole. Yeah, a bookstore. I can dig it. That'd be the best, <laughs> best wormhole around. Very strange. Now, the other thing about him, about Frank, is that he used to be a, a police officer. He was a police officer for all of his life. And so he is somebody who, um, you know, can be believed. He can be trusted, ideally. Now, he also told his, his story to a local uh, publication. I don't know if it was The Echo again or someone else. They had him describe the shops, not only Crips, but like I said, what else around the area? Yeah, there was that van called Cardens, or Cardens was on the the side of the van. Turns out Cardens was a van delivery service back in Liverpool back in the the sixties that has since folded. Uh, Crips was in the right place. The other landmarks he says were in a, the right place as well. Now there's one last story from Bold Street, and it's uh, very similar to the previous two. 
basically this one's about a young woman named Imogen. Imogen was in Liverpool. She decided, okay, I'm going to pick up some, some baby stuff for my sister. She just had a baby. And she finds a store called Mother Care on Bold Street. Never seen it before, but she says, okay, let's go in there, try it out. And she just notices that everything is super, super, super cheap. Yeah. Like crazy cheap. And she says, okay, well, in that case, and she just grabs like half She's the like, store. She's like, ready to go. Yeah, and, and takes it all up to the clerk, tries to check out, and she hands the clerk her, her debit card because she hadn't brought cash. And he just kind of looks at it. Like, what is, <laughs> like what is, what, what is this? Here? And then he goes and um, goes and talks to his manager, and the manager comes back and says, like, we can't accept this. Sorry. Freaking weirdo. <laughs> what is this, Tom Poolery? Yeah, and so she says, okay, not a problem. I'll come back tomorrow with cash. She goes home and, and tells her mother about it, and her mother says, yeah, that used to be a thing. Like, there used to be a mother care store there, but now it's a bank. I know this specifically because that's it's bank my I bank. Yeah. <laughs> I go there all the time. And she says, no, 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 no. And so they fight about it. The next day, they go back together, and sure enough, it's a bank. It's a bank. There's, there's nothing there, just a bank. And, uh, you know, that's Bold Street. That's, and that's just one of, I mean, I found. Bold Street, man. Keeping it real. Keeping yeah. it fresh. <laughs> it's. Keeping keeping your it, toes. Keeping it surreal, I would say. <laughs> keeping it weirdly preserved in time. Um, that's just one of dozens of stories. And I mean, so, it's, I don't know, maybe it's a hot spot for wormholes. I, <laughs> right. Well, that's what's so weird about it is it's, it's the only place I could find that has, like, multiple accounts per, in yeah. one place. Maybe it's just a hotbed for supernatural activity. And I mean, I'm not saying that that's not possible. I'm just saying as far as the physics that we know, it's not possible. It's not possible. <laughs> well, that's so, okay. I mean, it could be uh, yeah, it could be some weird like fourth, fifth, twelfth dimensional things occurring right. in that we just we don't have the technology to to observe it yet. That, right. Uh, but it's far fetched. I understand, man. Scientifically, I'm it not, hurts me. That's what's so strange. None of this makes any scientific sense, but there are these little bits of proof, like especially Imogen, who would not, from what I can tell, would not have been alive when that store was there in the first place. With, wait, 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 wait. Did that store exist back in the 50s and 60s? Yeah. So Liverpool experienced a giant wormhole Are we going to go about the back Beatles in the right 60s. now? The and we Beatles just keep... did this? <laughs> Is that what you're saying? No. The musical but that's amazing. sonic energy of the Beatles forming in Liverpool created, created a rift in time. Yes. I'm going to I'm going to steal I'm going to steal it from you. I can dig it. Boom. So that's <laughs> Bold Street. Uh it's bold, it's beautiful, it's brash, it's great. So this last one is also a very famous um time slip. Now, it's also covered by another amazing podcast i'm just throwing out podcast recommendations left and right it's because you keep listening to all of them i know how <laughs> how do you dare find all this time sam i don't so this I one knowledge was covered by a podcast called unexplained they're amazing uh just fantastic it's a one man are they amazing show. or are they amazing amazing <laughs> uh it's just a one-man show um and he did an entire episode on time slips. That's where I first heard of this story, and I did a little more digging on it from there. But, you know, if you're, if you're interested in what you're hearing now, go check out. It's just called Unexplained. Uh, the episode, I think, is called Time Out of Joint. So our last, we, we technically have That's two good. more stories. This is our last, like, time slip story. And uh, it comes to us from January 2nd, 1950. Now... There's one witness to this, and her name is Miss Elizabeth F. Smith. And she's a single woman of about 55. She's known as a spinster in her local community. Aww. I know. I, that's so mean. <laughs> I know, right? She was at a New Year's cocktail party um, when she was, uh, she had a great time there. She decided to drive home. But the weather wasn't great. No, it had been snowing, and then it was raining. It was pitch black uh, by the time she was driving home, and suddenly her car skidded off into uh, like a bank, a, like a, a little ditch. bit of a yeah, yeah. But thankfully, like she a ravine, was, almost like a little ravine-ish thing on the side of the road. Yeah, yeah. But thankfully, she was completely. I'm sure we can imagine. Yeah, she was completely unharmed, uh, which is great. That's wonderful. But 
she found herself about eight miles from home one way and even I think even further from where she came from the other way. So she's like, screw it. I guess I'm hoofing it. Yeah. Well, and she also had her little dog with her and she didn't want her little dog to get cold. So she does. She decides, okay, we're going to head home. We're going to trek home. We can do it. And she was doing really well until like the last two miles of her journey. She starts to get just exhausted. And then on top of the exhaustion, she also just feels off. She just feels unsettled. Things are strange. Yeah. Well, and there's a well-known shortcut that would have taken her off the road through the woods and pretty much dropped her right where she needed to be in half the time. But she didn't want to do that for some reason. She said, I don't feel right about that. I don't know. A shortcut might be a little bit more treacherous Mm -hmm. compared to the main road. Yeah. That makes more sense. It does make more sense. But she, she describes just having fear. Okay. Real palpable fear. So at about 2 a.m. then... She's about half a mile from home, and she notices something very strange. So off in the distance, she can see Dunnachin Hill, which was a well-known landmark outside of her town. Uh, as she got closer, she noted mo- noticed moving dots of light. She's w- weirded out. She's confused. Mm-hmm. But she's so close to home. She thinks it's alien. Uh, they're they're kind of red, though, right? They, well, they've got that reddish-orangish tinge to them. They're not like bright white lights that we're... Well, used it's, to in the it's UFO like UFO phenomenon. It's fire. Fire. So that's what she saw was fire, and um, she was she was confused for sure. But she said, "I just got to keep going. Like I can't stop now." So she starts going now to the right of her, about a third of a mile away. She sees more lights, and the mm-hmm. weird thing is, they're in this field, and they're just moving around there. She says, "Okay, it's weird, but I just got to get home." She keeps going, and then. She really gets freaked out to her right again, this time only 50 yards away. There's a group of lights, and they seem to be coming towards her. Oh, but, man. Yeah, but they're not coming right towards her. They're, like, arcing through the through the field. She just starts to, to book it. Now, what she also notices is that while some of the lights seem to be, like like we said, kind of coming towards her, Other ones she noticed were moving kind of erratically, and she would see the light scoop down. So she she realizes and understands fairly quickly that what she's seeing are torches, Mm -hmm. and the torches are being held by men, and the men are dressed in in, old, yeah, old black coats. They're wearing dark tunics, dark leggings, dark boots, and as the light of the torch comes down and illuminates the ground, she sees just piles of the dead, just corpses upon corpses. Oh, gosh. And this guy is kicking them over and trying to identify them and saying, okay, is this one ours? Is this one someone else's? That's either a very dedicated reenactment or... Something else. Something else. So the other thing that she notices of these torches, like you had mentioned, they're red. They're not... They're not your typical torch. They're not like yellowy orange tinge. They're, they're no, deeper. In color. They're very vibrantly red. Now the dog starts to growl and she says, Oh, oh no, no, don't bark. Don't bark. <laughs> Please don't bark. And she just hoofs it home. She gets home. She locks the door. She goes to bed. She's done. Mm-hmm. 20 years later, she's interviewed by a Dr. James McHarg, who is a member of of the Society of Psychical Research. Hmm, that name sounds so familiar it for should. some reason. That was, as our, our longtime listeners will know, that was the community, the, the society, that did a lot of the apparition, crisis apparition reports from our first episode. And they were doing the same sort of thing. This, this woman saw something strange, so they were documenting it, they were researching it. Now, during the interview, McHarg found Ms. Smith to be very authentic, very much, you know, it had been 20 years, but she hadn't lost a single detail of it. She remembered everything about it. She remembered the way they moved around the field, the way they were, were looking at the corpses, the, the hue of the torches themselves. And in the last 20 years, she had come to the conclusion that what she had seen was an event known as the Battle of Nectansmere, which happened in 685 Nectansmere. AD. Nectansmere. Nectansmere. 
Nick Tanzmere. Yes. This happened in... If you'd like to hear 30 seconds of me trying to say that again, <laughs> become one of our Patreon sponsors. Yeah, because you're going to hear a lot, a lot in this episode. <laughs> now, this battle occurred in 685 AD. It was a battle fought between the Picts and the Northumbrians. Now, she had lived in that area all her life. They knew about this battle. It would be strange if she didn't know about this battle. And so, right off the bat, it's like, okay, maybe she's just you know, hallucinating Mm -hmm. for one, lying for another. But she had some strange, strange um, uh, details again. So one of which is the movement of these soldiers, which she charted out for the the good Dr. McCarg. And the way she charted it exactly followed something that she could not have known, which is the outline of a lake that used to be in the field during the battle. Yeah. Yeah. The lake was drained hundreds of years ago. And again, while they may know, okay, there's a lake, she couldn't have known the exact pattern of the shoreline. Yeah, that was only even then recently discovered by the use of aerial photography. So that was the first weird thing. The second one was the torches. She had said they're so red, like they're so red. Uh, how How are they so red? And he assumed at first that she was talking about the the flame of the torches. Mm-hmm. But what she was actually talking about was the shaft, the actual torch itself. Oh. Which, if you're an invading army or a defending army, you're going to make your torches out of the trees that are already there. You're not going to take thousands of pounds of wood for torches when you've got wood all around you. Hey, what if I have great wood for, <laughs> for torch making? You're still not going to do that. It's just, it's, it's, a, okay. it's cumbersome. It's a burden. You're going you're gonna to make use of the environment. So in the environment is a tree called the Scottish fir, and the Scottish fir's roots are very, very, very red. And so that's what she was saying. This, again, just a little detail of, like, how could she know or why would she make that up? I mean, if, if I was sitting there lying about something I saw, I'd just say, oh, yeah, they had torches, just normal torches. It was a torch. What, what, what else do you want? <laughs> like, that's crazy enough in this day and age. But she did. She saw these torches that seemed to have been made by the roots of the Scottish fir. So these two accounts combined, and McCarg came away saying, it's genuine. I'm taking it. It's authentic. Uh, and that is, to me, one of the most compelling time slip stories of all time. It's pretty wild. Yeah. You know, everything else, there's that one has an element of like secret hidden knowledge that that she could not have had access to. But, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, there's one other time slip that I heard of while doing a little bit of research as well, also involving a storm. Now, okay. um, the one that I heard of I I can't for the life of me remember his name. Uh, all I remember the fact that he flew in both World War One and Two mm-hmm. for uh, the British and was actually knighted afterwards. Um, and then flying over Britain in 1940, he flew over an airstrip. Now the airstrip was abandoned, but he went through a storm that kind of threw him off trajectory. He ended up spinning around and had to fly over the airstrip again. Okay. Uh, the second time he flew over it, it was actually fully functioning, uh, and he noticed a couple different planes, uh, a couple biplanes, which are pretty typical for the era, mm-hmm. uh, and then a single wing plane as well, which is very not typical at that point in time. So a single wing? You mean like a, a jet airliner? Like a like, like a, we have now? Like a regular fighter? Okay. Like oh, a regular okay. fighter, so a, a single a single wing system mm-hmm. instead of having a biplane. Um, also painted yellow, and the crew on, on the airstrip as well were all in blue. Also, not typical for that day and age, mm-hmm. uh, for any kind of British airway or uh, royal um, royal air force. Royal air force. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, so he thought it was peculiar, very very odd. Uh, he made his trip. Ended up going back home as well. Uh, through the same storm, it was back to normal, completely abandoned. Hmm. It wasn't until about five years after that that planes started becoming painted yellow. 
and uh, single uh, alt and yeah, single wing, but also um, having flight crew dressed in blue. So interesting. Uh, he didn't bring that up until fifty seven, mm-hmm. which and and tell this, I guess, until his deathbed, he truly believed that he uh, saw a glimpse into the future. Into the future. That's interesting. So I mean, maybe there's some correlation with storms. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Time storms and, and weird uh, stuff, weird energy. Yeah, electronic fog. You know, we talked about that in High Brazil. Interesting. Some strange. Maybe High Brazil was just a time slip. It could be. Maybe there was something there before, and it uh, it it's gone now, the or in the future, or in the future. That would be you more know. likely. There you go. To the aliens. <laughs> yeah, man. Sure, man. But our last story is I. I truly don't associate it with like it being a time no sh- i don't time either slip. but it's a good story and oh when it's you a great look, one it's when, when super you're, interesting when you're researching time slips it always comes up but we're going to talk about it and then why it's not a time slip here so go for it. this one as well no proof yeah <laughs> i'm just gonna I say mean, <laughs> there is no proof of this There's now it's a lot of accounts yeah there are many many accounts of it it's set in the year 1954 and uh, it's it's something that has been recorded and written down multiple times. The earliest of its recording is 1981, um, but no hard evidence at all. But that's yeah, okay. There's, there's really nothing remaining. It's a, just just uh, testimonials. And, yeah, yeah. You know. It's a great story, though. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. So now the year's 1954. A flight lands at Hanada Airport in Tokyo, Japan, coming mm-hmm. from Europe. The passengers disembark. They make their way through through customs. But one of the passengers is a middle-aged, smartly dressed, bearded Caucasian man. He speaks French fluently, but he can also switch flawlessly into Japanese and other languages as well. He tells the uh, officials there that he was there on a business trip. It had been his, his third or fourth time that year that he's come through, and he presents his passport. As soon as... And it wasn't quite... Quite right. Yeah, as soon as they see this passport, things start to get dicey. Now, the custom officers become upset, and they say, you know, where are you from? Like, where are you from? And he says... It's out of order, yeah. Yeah, he says, well, I'm from Tared. And they say, where are you from? And he says, I'm from Tared. Look at my passport. And sure enough, his passport shows... You know, this guy's name, which unfortunately is lost to time, <laughs> and his country of origin being Tourette. His passport is also stamped multiple times from yep. multiple different countries. Japan, he's been stamped twice, uh, like he said, third or fourth time there. He had multiple different denominations of, of money in his wallet. And I, I, yeah, I actually came across this separately as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that he also pulled out his, his checkbook. As a, mm-hmm. another way to verify who he was. Yes. But, but. <laughs> the problem is, they ask him again, where are you from? He says, I'm from Tared. And, and, they, of course, and they pull out a map, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Of course, they say, there is no place called Tared. Yeah. So we'll give you one more chance. Point to where you're from. And they do. They pull out the map, and he points right in between Spain and France. There's this little town, or not town, little principality called... Andorra, and it's nestled within the Pyrenees Mountains. It's known for duty free shopping and ski resorts, and it's just a fabulous place to live. He points at Andorra, and they say, That's Andorra. And he says, There's no such thing as Andorra. And he gets kind of freaked out about yeah, it. Yeah, he's, he's upset as well. He says, There's no such thing as Andorra. That's Tored. Tored has existed for a thousand years. I don't know what this Andorra thing is. And they, at this point, they're worried. They're like, this guy could be a criminal. He's got like a nut loose or something. Yeah, yeah, he could be dangerous to himself, dangerous to others. He could be a criminal. He could be on the run. And they say, okay, all right, we're going to just try to check you out. We're just going to check your story. So they call the company. He tells them, well, I'm here to do business with this company. They call the company. Nothing on file. Nothing never on heard of him. Nah. No, never heard of him. Call the, the hotel where he's supposed to be staying. No reservations. Nothing. Yeah. And then, uh, like you said, he pulls out his checkbook. The bank doesn't, doesn't exist. exist. And he is just, everybody is just freaking out. And yeah. so they take him to a, 
a hotel right near the airport. And they say at, at the very least, he's a criminal for falsifying a passport. Like, that's not something you're allowed to do. Right. At the very most, he could be, you know, a of murderer, or a thief, anything like that. So they keep him there overnight. They post two guards at the door. In the morning, they've come to some sort of consensus about what to do. They open the door to the room, which should be noted, very high up. Not on the first, second, third, fourth flo- floor. It's higher than that. They open the door and he's gone. Poof. Poof. Like I said, there were, there were guards stationed there all night. When they went back to the security office in the airport to, to try to find his documentation, it was gone as well. Mm-hmm. Which is just like the perfect. Of course. It's, yeah. the, it's the perfect, the perfect setting, story. Yeah. yeah, for an urban legend. It's like, well, you can't verify it because all of his stuff disappeared. Right, and it took place in the 50s, so it's yeah. not like we had cameras everywhere like we do now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a really interesting story. I don't think it quite points out time slips. No. Well, and the thing is, a lot of people say maybe he's from the future where this place called Tarred is, is a real thing. But he's doing business with a local company and staying at a local hotel. Right, and it's existed for a thousand years. And let's be honest, we hardly ever use checkbooks nowadays. Yeah. Like, if he's from the future, I absolutely don't think he'd be carrying around a checkbook. That's crazy. Yeah, it's not, you know, it's not a typical time slip. Yeah, and he doesn't, and he doesn't really like, he's not out of place compared Mm -hmm. to everyone else. He's just, everything seems normal, but. His documentation's wrong. Yeah, he's totally and completely normal. He's just not in the right place. It's not like he's wearing futuristic clothing or doesn't have, you know, a drone falling around yeah. telling him all his assistant stuff. Like, you know? You know what I mean? Like, there, there is nothing You have three far-fetched. meetings. <laughs> exactly. Get to the meetings. Well, I like to picture, that like, Scarlett terrible. Johansson's voice from her, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> so... So That's... I think that one is clearly just another universe. Yeah, like he, it... <laughs> he he just he just teleported universes. That's all. Just just popped in, said hello for a bit, uh, stayed a while, and uh, popped back maybe to a different one. If it happened at all. That's yeah. all it can be. Like, There's no that's... other situation where Or it's, or it's you know, possible. it's completely falsified and yeah. she was pulling a prank of some sort for some reason. Uh, why? No right. clue. Why? <laughs> or it'd be funny, man. Or third option. Aliens? No, nothing. Oh, okay. It no part of it is true. Yeah, like, there was no man who showed whole, up. Or the whole like story's that. falsified, which but is, I mean, possible. It's always possible. But again, we're gonna give the benefit of you the know. Doubt. I, I feel like it'd still be like a fun story about right. this well, stranger and, that I met at the airport. And like I said, it was it one of the the earliest references to it is in 1981. It's referenced in multiple different sources, magazines, publications, all of this. And they, it's before the internet. It's before this thing where you, you, know, you could just hoax anything and get all of the information to all of the sources at once. Like, this information came from somewhere. And granted, that's how it always is with urban legends. But for me, I'm going to say it happened. I'm going to say it happened. I'm going to say he came from a different reality. I'm going to say he left that same <laughs> night. Who knows? But um, You know, it's, it's weird when we get to the end of the episodes like this. And we tell these just out there, outrageous stories. And the, what makes the most sense is, yeah, he's clearly from a different universe. Obviously. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why we're even discussing this any longer. <laughs> just let it go. <laughs> so that's time slips. Yeah. And what do you, what do you think about time slips in general? Uh, like, how do you think that they're happening? How so... I mean, theoretically, time travel is possible. We don't know enough, possibly about quantum mechanics, to do it. I don't think if it hap- if it occurs naturally, I don't think it'd be to the scale that a human or humans can transport through it yet. You know, I, again, um, in the beginning of the episode, I said that scientists believe that possibly these microscopic wormholes are happening in sub atomic levels theoretically we might be able to one day reach down pull one of them and stretch it on open and possibly stabilize it and that's the other thing is that they don't stabilize easily they'll collapse rather quickly at least in theory because again we have never observed anything time slips are interesting Mm -hmm. i don't think they'd happen naturally with without a ton of energy Mm -hmm. at least not on earth maybe in maybe in space that's a little bit more conceivable. Uh, other than that, you know, I, I, I truly just believe it's, it's you know, glitches in the matrix. <laughs> uh, 
This yes. is, so this we've is, been referencing yeah. that in and out the whole show. We'll um, see how many reference to it survives editing. Right. What do you mean by glitches in the Matrix? Uh, we're, we're all just living in a simulation. And sometimes is simulations sweating. freak out. Yeah, he yeah. is sweating I, right now. So I've been contemplating this for like five days straight, oh, and it is it, baby boy. So this is what freaks me out. The you will I've are afraid. Been, I've been you're, contemplating you're afraid this. of of dogs watching you in the middle of the night. I am terrified with the fact that am I really rubbing my elbow against a table, or am I just a very sophisticated okay. AI? So for one thing, I've been contemplating this for. Years and every time I do, whenever I Dude, actually you're sit up pretty down, well. <laughs> I know I didn't though. There's some bad times in my life. Anyway, any time I start to think too much about it, I get closer and closer and closer to a mental breakdown. It's probably and our just have to Yeah, I just have to pull up. Like I'm headed nose diving towards the ocean, and you just have to pull up. And so what I just tell myself is, who cares? If it's all a simulation, it doesn't make it any less real to me. When I get hit by a car, I'm still going to get hurt. When, you know, my dog snuggles me, I'm still happy. Who cares if it's not real? It's fine. Oh, God. <laughs> so it's that, or it's just, you know, parts of science Moving that we, we don't quite know yet. And we haven't quite discovered yet. Fair. That's the fun thing about science, that we like to observe everything and be able to test it. And again, theoretically, with what we know about space-time currently, it's it's possible to try and travel both forward and backwards. Forward just is the easy one. Yeah, I dig. So that's my feelings about it. Okay. So it's for, possible. Yeah, but highly unlikely. To the point where I might think that we're just living in a matrix. Right, and that's fair. So for me, so for me, for one thing, I subscribe to the block time theory which states that time is always happening. Like, the past is always happening, the future is always happening, the present is always happening. It's all congruent, it's all one thing. Yeah, right now, right now, in 1776, they're signing the Declaration of Independence. Right now, you know, hopefully 80 years from now, okay, well, that's a bit much. Right now, hopefully 60 years from now, I'm, like, lying on my deathbed about to die. Like, time is always happening no matter what, and you cannot change it. So, for instance, if I was to somehow go back in time and my goal was to kill Hitler, I would not succeed because unless it was me in the bunker that day in Berlin, I mean, that's the only way it would have happened. There's no way that I'm going to be able to go back well, and kill Hitler killed himself. Unless it was me that day in the bunker okay. in Berlin. That's what I'm saying. Sorry. Let me try. Let me try with another thing. Let's let's be more localized. Let's say I wanted to go back in time to stop you from getting a haircut. How about that? No, that's too innocent. Say like, oh, wow. Okay. Let's say, okay, so I have an arch nemesis. I'm not going to say his name, but I have an arch nemesis. Let's say I wanted to kill him when he was a baby. You know, theoretically. Okay. So I could try to go back in time. And I could try to, to, to stop him, either kill him as a baby or stop his parents from ever getting together. But it's not going to happen. you create a paradox. So, no, yeah. you don't create a paradox. Right, because you can't, because nature won't allow you to. Nothing happens because <clears throat> he's alive now. Right. So if something happened... Which is one of those third possibilities that yeah. I spoke about. Right. So because time is always happening, like... In theory, it might be like, yeah, I'm going to go back in time and I'm going to do this and it's going to be the first time anyone's ever done that in that time period. But it's not. If I go back to the year 1965 to do something, I've always been in 1965, you know, did you, quote unquote. Did you see that Hulu original series with um, James Franco? Oh, the one about going back in time. And uh, There's Kennedy. There's been so many time travel things yeah. lately. Yeah. It, it was, I enjoyed it uh, because a lot of it, the, the closer and closer he got to saving Kennedy, mm -hmm. the more and more time, like, fought back. Oh, interesting. Like, okay. naturally. Which was also an interesting concept. Mm -hmm. I can dig it. And that's what that just kind of reminded me of, is that the closer you get to altering history, right, the more significant history it kind of punches back at you. Right. Well, and yeah, I mean, there's going to be something that, that stops you from changing history. So... That's my theory about like the nature of time in general. As far as that plays into to time slips, if all time's happening at the same time, you yeah. just slip in, you slip out. 
That's literally all it is. If it's all just a consciousness thing, let's say that our consciousness has been around since the beginning of time, and whether it's through reincarnation or whether it's, you know, that, that we're only in a body for right now, but before and after that, you know, we're, we're still, our consciousness is somewhere part of the collective unconscious, you just slip. So there's no physical change. I think that that's my biggest theory. You do not physically move back in time. Your consciousness moves back in time, which you don't need a huge amount of energy to have happen. You don't need to open a wormhole or a portal. You just slip just like that. That's why it's a time slip. Or it's a glitch. It's a glitch in the matrix. All right, guys. So that's time slips. Right now we're at like an hour and 40 minutes, so I'm sure I'll get this down to an hour. But if you want to hear those other 40 minutes of screaming and sidetracking and all sorts of greatness. Five minutes uh, of me talking to you alone when there. Sam's in the restroom. <laughs> sign up. great. Sign up for our Patreon. How about those 30 seconds of me trying to pronounce words? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> uh, yeah, sign up for our Patreon. At, you'll, you'll get full access to... Uh, weirdly uncut version of the show i don't I know am so sorry yeah <laughs> i don't know why people want that other than they really like us but on that note we do have three new patrons this week oh boy oh boy oh dear so the first one is da, 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 da. the first one is Gemma. what's up Gemma? yay yeah. thank you Gemma. the second one is uh it's actually our very good friend jerry Jerry from Hillbilly Horror Stories. Oh, Jerry. Yeah, he's a good guy. So, yeah. Yeah, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. And then our uh, our last patron is uh, Jessica Miles. So, yeah. Yeah, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. Now, all right. I'm not sure exactly where we left off last week, but we're just going to go from here. So, the first one that we're going to so do. So, if we miss you. If we miss you, please let us know. Tweet at me, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make sure to do it next week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the first one is by Dan Lefebvre and who's ready for another shout out. Dan runs the based on a true story podcast, which is amazing. He goes through, he, he watches movies that are based on a true story and then he tells us the actual true story. So I've listened to a quite a, a good amount of them. I've listened to like, he has one on Mulan. He has one on the Revenant. Mulan is crazy. I know it is. It she is. is so more, so, so much more BA in real life than mm. what she was in the movie. Uh, Dan says a fresh look at the unknown, unknown, my new favorite show for paranormal and all things. Well, not normal. Love <laughs> the conversational style while still being educating and a very practical point of view on so many fascinating subjects. Why are you still reading this review? Hit subscribe now. Do it. <laughs> oh, dang. Hit subscribe now. That's, that's me, not him. Oh, okay. I was going to say, <laughs> sheesh, tone it back a bit. That's all right. Relax. Well, thank you so much for that review, Dan. That's great. Now, this next one is by Lynn, who is probably, she's like one of our top two or top three biggest fans. And uh, she just. We've every, got fans. We have fans. And Lynn is, is like a flag bearer for our fans. Every time we post anything anywhere. She's liking it. She's commenting it. She's she's replying to it. She's retweeting it. Yes. And we just, Lynn, we love you so much. You're fantastic. Um, so Lynn says, this is an awesome and well-researched podcast. I would recommend this to anyone. So thank you so much, Lynn. Sweet. The next one is by me to Uh He says, good show. Uh, he says, great topic so far. Would like more guests, which I'm sure will happen as the show gains popularity. Looking forward to all future shows. The only criticism is that there are f a few too many inside jokes. Other than that, keep up the great work. Ah, shoot. Jason, we tone have to, it down. We well, have, well, you know, the I thing is, is that we just have to get everyone in on the jokes. That's fair. And we can try that. But yeah, we'll work I, on it. I re-listened to some of the older episodes. Well, older is an also last week's episode. We and do I a fair it. bit of that. So <laughs> yeah. we'll try to tone it down. We tried to tone that down today. Um, and as far as interviews, yes, you are correct. We'll, uh, we'll announce those as they're coming up. We do have like four or five scheduled either on our show or on other people's shows. So that's pretty cool. Now, this next one is by Pam Hammer. Again, we actually did Pam Hammer last week, but I know now that it is because I know who this is in real life. They're oh, not like a friend. Cool. They're just a fellow podcaster. Um, his real name, I'm not going to disclose, 
but he goes by the pseudonym uh, Nate Hale, and he hosts the Conspirators podcast, which if you like our show, you're going to love their show. I guarantee it. Like, I'll put money on it. He just did an episode on The God Machine, which happened in like the 1860s or something in that time period where a preacher tried to build a mechanical god. It was dope. It was <laughs> really cool. So go check that out. He, he updated his review, uh, so we're going to read it again. It's totally different now. He says, it's rare when I come across a podcast as well-researched and fun to listen to as this one. The hosts have a great rapport and a fun sense of humor. The subjects are all stuff that I find most interesting, from Egyptian curses to UFOs and cryptids. Even with subjects I think I know a lot about, I still find myself learning something new. If you like shows like Astonishing Legends, <laughs> you should definitely <laughs> give this a try. It's well worth it. So thank you so much. Um, this next one, and I think actually our second to last one here, this is by J.M. Shot K, who I'm pretty sure is Jessica Miles, our, our newest patron. Uh, she says, love it. Really enjoying this podcast. The hosts are very thorough in their research and present the information in a fun and lighthearted manner. She might change her opinion after she hears the <laughs> extended shows where we yell at each other. <laughs> that's fine. Um, I that's, might... that's where all the inside jokes are made, though. That's true. That's, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. I myself want to believe in the mysterious, but also tend to be skeptical. So I appreciate that the hosts seem to have a healthy amount of skepticism while also being open-minded. They present all sources, but also weigh the credibility of the sources. Looking forward to more episodes. So that is, there's that one. That one was really nice. Now there's one last one. It hasn't been posted yet, but I know that it's coming because um, Alan... You wrote it. No, <laughs> I should. <laughs> I wrote this. It's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> Uh, I know it's coming because uh, Alan Jenkins from the Beware and Warning podcast, the Choose Your Own Adventure, he um, he posted it on Twitter today. So it's coming down the line. His says, and I love this one. <laughs> he, <laughs> I love this one. All right. It says, I want to believe a little. Sam and Jason are a standard in paranormal podcasts for research and rapport. Pairs well with a nice sausage biscuit. <laughs> What? He, he was on Twitter the other day and he's like he was like what food goes well with your podcast? And I was like what? What kind of sausage? So that's talking like uh like Louisa or are we, are we going... am... what? Jimmy D. Or like a... That's what I'm going to say. Oh god. Uh Paris... we have no culture. <laughs> it's not over yet. Pairs well with a nice sausage biscuit. Also in quotation marks Satanic Panic, Pretty Funny, Jason 2017. <laughs> it's a quote from you. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there we go. So those are the reviews, guys. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be honest. That was amazing. It was, right? Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, thank you, everyone, for everything. We had an amazing month. Um, we did so freaking well. It's insane. And we're just so grateful for that. Uh, we do have one other favor for, for, to ask of you, uh, and that is we're actually trying to learn a little more about our listeners. So uh, I'm going to put a link in the show notes. We have a survey that if you don't mind taking, we'd be very, very appreciative. And if you complete it, uh -oh. now I don't know if it's going to tell me who did what or like who said what or whatever. So if you complete it, take a screenshot of it, email it to me, we're going to enter your your name into a raffle, and uh, I'm not going to tell you what the prize is, but it's super dope, and I'll tell you in a week or two. So do I, that. He hasn't even told me what the prize is he, yet. He doesn't. He doesn't know anything about this. Uh, so that survey is at survey.libsyn.com slash notalonepodcast. So I'll put that in the notes uh, there. And, yeah, also, just to be honest... I mean, we got so many reviews this week. It added like 10 minutes to the show. We may have to just start doing like one super great review every week, but we will, no matter what, still mention by name everyone who reviews us. So remember, whether enjoying a nice warm stroll on a beautiful summer's afternoon down your street or a late night stroll through the dark ages, we are not, not alone. alone.